Well, now people <coughs> ask for assignments. Well, we have an assignment. It's to read Third Nephi. So if you'll turn to, we're going fast now over some stuff now. Uh, turn to the sixth chapter in Third Nephi, and uh, since we have all read it, is, is Sister Ivan's here? Is she among us? Sister Ivan's? Ah, yeah, Sister Ivan's. This sixth chapter, isn't it something? Didn't it just knock you off the Christmas tree? What's the remarkable thing about it? I think it's the most powerful editorial for us in the whole Book of Mormon, probably. I say that about every chapter. But this one really does it. This one covers all the ground. You notice it starts out with a model society. They've been through a long war. They've suffered terribly. They return as a model society. They reform very wisely. They uh, rehabilitate the enemy and all this sort of thing and begin immense prosperity. And then they start becoming spoiled. And uh, then business becomes everything and they're divided into classes. And then, lo and behold, uh, you get a secret government and the lawyers take over and everything collapses. And that's the sixth chapter. What a marvelous cycle. Now we've got that. It's probably the most condensed cycle. Is it the story of American Capsule? Well, read it carefully. It's very condensed. There's an awful lot, but the next chapter does just like it. And what is the result of that? Thank you very much, Sister Ivans. Uh, another Ivans, that's Michelle. Tanya Ivans, is she here? Is Tanya here? Ah, now the next one. The seventh chapter is a different thing. And since you've studied it with great care, that be the assignment, uh, a remarkable thing happens. They have a totally new social system emerges from that. Isn't it? And what is it? Yes, they go back to their original tribal organization. The tribals had always been in place. It was just in place. Uh, the thing was set up and just waiting to take over. They had the whole inner structure going all the time, just as all the Indian tribes do. It's not the tribes that count, it's the, it's the fratries. It's the groups inside, it's the brotherhoods that always keep the families together, keep the name, keep the tribe. It's the turtle tribe or the bear tribe or, or the snake tribe and so forth, clan rather, uh, and it's not the tribe. Well, so they're back to their old tribal system. Then th what would have happened, speculating a little bit, Brother Johansson, Brother Johansson, uh, he's caught in the snow. The Scandinavians couldn't be stopped by snow. Uh, Brother Clark Johnson, Johnson, ah. Uh, this could go on forever. This is their normal way of existence. But let's put a stop to the whole thing. We're back to a tribal organization. We're back to square one now. Have we got to go through that dismal routine again? What happens to arrest the whole thing and start a wholly new ball game? Destruction. destruction, mass destruction. It's not one of the great world destructions, but it is such as we do have. We've had such mass destructions. They talk about the summer of 1983 and things like that that were that uh, shook the whole world, changed the whole world. Yes, it changes the demography, it changes the topography, and it changes the culture too. We're gonna have, but only locally. Notice this, this is local here. It tells us most cities weren't destroyed. Around, there, were, there was an epicenter where the destruction was nearly complete, but people escaped. Others hadn't even heard of the earthquake as far as that goes. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a, a sudden, a drastic shifting of continents or anything like that, though that was what was behind it. Well, then I noticed the ninth chapter here. Well, so they have the new demography they set up. It hadn't lasted very long, had it? Uh, let me see now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, we've got all kinds of Johnsons here. Is Michael Johnson here? That's your Michael. Well, you're Michael Johnson. Oh, Clark Johnson. Ah, now what happens? See, notice in every one of these chapters, the whole picture changes as if you had to Turn off the lights, change the sets, wait between the acts, have an intermission, you come back and it's a different scene after the first one. So now what happens, I would call it the lowering of the shields or the space shield or something like that. And you get that in the ninth chapter. What am I talking about, Brother Johnson, when I think of that? Now the people are all gathered here at the temple and then something happens. They hear a voice. Now, this is out of the world. This is something. I say it's just like lowering the screen that they do in these, uh, these science fiction things, you know. You have a protective screen that sets you from space, whatever it is. And we do have such a screen around us. We can't see through it at all. The screen is lowered, and all of a sudden, in the ninth chapter here, they hear a voice speaking through to them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And it talks to them, and rejoicing, and so forth. And the voice comes through uh, to, out of outer space, so to speak. We, the Earth has, does have a magnetic shield, and this is very basic. And when a major meteorite, this has become a very strong issue now, of course, the, uh, the idea of the uh, nemesis. The, uh, when a giant a meteorite or asteroid strikes the Earth, as it does every 
26 million years, something like that, when we go into a particular serum. It gives you such a jar that the differential that goes between the, 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 the core of the Earth and its and the and the outer and the inner shell, which is uh, liquid. See, they the inner parts of the Earth rotate at different rates, and that produces this current. And when the Earth is heavily jarred, we're told, it breaks down that magnetic shield. And then, bang, in come the solar rays from one side, the solar wind, and in come the, the uh, cosmic rays from the other, and in come the showers. Oh, we, we, the heavy side layer disappears, and uh, the Earth goes in one of those. It has about, about every 26 million years now. They say that happens. It completely changes. It wipes out all the species. 90% of them, new species emerge and so forth and so on. Well, this is the sort of thing that goes on here. Uh, this isn't as bad as that, but we do have that shield that's between us and the outside. And here I do think it's relevant to talk about the cone of time. And this is a uh, this is what this book is about, incidentally. He's very intriguing on this subject of, of the cone of time. I'll draw a picture of it. This, you know what this is, the cone of time. Well, perpend. Show what's, what it's supposed to be like. This is an event. It is called an event. We'll make it a real distinctive event. It's a brilliant flash of light that lasts only a hundredth of a second. So the light starts going out from here in all four directions, of course, and here. We'll make it to, well, we'll make it to here, and to here, and we'll say to here. This is as fast as it goes, see? This is one light, here, well, or a second, the well-known 186,300 miles a second. Goes here, then the next second it's here, and the next second. You have to be here to see it, then you have to be here to see it, but this, this is time is passing mean times. Here is a second or year, whatever the unit is, a second or a year. You have to be here. The time has traveled this far in this much time. So if you're out here, you'll see it. See, this is a cone. If the next second or the next light year, the next hour, you're out here, then you'll see the flash again. And if you're out here, then you'll see the flash again. The reason it's a cone, it happens in both directions. It goes down this way too, the past. And also, of course, it's round. It goes out in all directions, but also all directions like a globe. So it's like the shell of a bubble that you're actually on here. So here we're going out, and here is one light year, and here is one light year distance, and here's the distance of one light year. When the two correspond, you see it. You see the flash. Now, that's not imagining it. Today, you can see, you take a, a nova or a, a requesan, and it suddenly flashes, and a thousand or ten thousand years later, we see the flash. It's the same flash. It's the real event. It's not the same event and no other. You say, oh, yes, but if you get closer up to it, then you see the real. No, you don't. Light takes time to travel anyway. Remember, one of the basic measures of light is the time it takes to cover the, the thickness of an electron, which is ridiculous, but that is actually a unit of time that's used. And uh, so here we have this. We goes out here, we go out here. Now, the point is here, if you travel out here, you can see it. If you get at the right time, the right place, you'll see it. But what if you travel along here right at the speed of light and you keep looking at it? Well. It keeps shining steadily, don't you? The light is shining, and as it, its speed goes out, as it goes out, you go out, you go out all along here, and this is your experience of the light. But it's only a flash. It only lasts for a hundredth of a second. This can't be the same event. Yes, it's the same event. It's not any different at all. This is your experience of it. In other words, time has ceased to exist. Well, you see that in all, the, in all your, your space movies and so forth, that uh, if you go with the speed of light, Einstein says, time has stopped. Time, and the nearer you get to it, the slower time goes. So here we go, the Fitzgerald's rule and so forth. So here we go out here, and the irony of it is, what I'm getting at here, is what is our experience of reality? You have to be at the time and place to experience that. Any place else, this has not, this has already happened. No, it hasn't. It's already happening. If you happen to be here, you, you'll see it. And this hasn't happened yet. Not yet, we'll say. So this is non-existent for you, and this is non-existent for you. That's finished. The light's, it's over and done. This hasn't ha Only this very second that you're living in. This is the well-known philosophical paradox, you see, where how long does it take for the future to become the past? Well, the future, when we came in here, we came in here uh, two minutes before the class. Uh, the class was still future. Now, already, five minutes after, it's all past. It's as dead as the pharaohs now. <laughs> it's past forever and ever. A hundredth of a second, it was still future, and there was still brilliant hope. A hundredth of a second after, it's all past, and there's nothing you can do about it, you see. So the fact is, we just live in this, in this reality here, and only see what's along here. How thick is this cone? 
Well, it's thinner than the thinnest membrane or film. It's, th it's that thickness of time. It has no thickness at all. So again, the poets are right when they talk about that. The, uh, Shakespeare says, we are the stuff that dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Reminds you of King Arthur. Well, here we are. When I make a model, our little life is rounded with a sleep. Well, here's our life in the middle, you see. This is sleep. You don't know what happens there. This is sleep. You don't know what happens here. And what about our little life here? Well, it's just a dream anyway, isn't it? Uh, our our uh, revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you. We're all spirits and have melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all that it inherits shall dissolve, and like this unsubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. And I immediately think of the tra vapor trails of a plane. That's the rack. When, it starts break when a cloud starts breaking up, that's the rack, you see. And, uh, and so we come along making a brilliant trail here, and all we know of life, all we have to show for our existence is what we remember. Because if you forget from day to day, you don't exist. That's the agony of Alzheimer's, isn't it? Then our, our <laughs> no, it's true. Then, then our vapor trail starts breaking up, doesn't it? And before long, it's into nothing. Our memory isn't much good. You see, it's, a, it's an interesting game. I play it all the time now to see just how much I can remember. And uh, does it make any difference? The whole thing is all fused together anyway. But you, know, you recall it now. The interesting thing is, of course, this is a very important part of the Gospel, the Book of Mormon too. remember? that hereafter our memories will be perfect, they'll be vivid, which means right along here everything will be... See, your light is shining present all the time. The time stands still and you can see this light. If you go with the speed of light, you look back and it's a steady light, not a hundredth of a second, lasts forever. And it's the same way with our experiences here. They'll be eternal when we shift gears that way. And uh, we talk about our vivid memories, the perfect you back, and a good hypnotist can do marvelous. And many times you hear people on the point of drowning or some other extreme crisis, their whole flash will, their whole light will flash before their eyes, and they really mean it. You see, you really mean the whole, you see the whole thing. So our memories play in strange things. We are strange beings, you see. Now this is what I'm talking about, the Lord appearing here, you hear this voice coming out of nowhere, that shouldn't happen, that's nonsense, that doesn't, common sense doesn't to tolerate that sort of thing, and so forth. And so, we have this uh, story, uh, King Oswald, that's the whole reason we have religion, we have the gospel. Remember, King Oswald was the first English king converted. He was having a banquet in his, in, his, in his great hall, and a Christian monk was present and was teaching him. And during the gayness of the banquet, the hall was lit with a fire, they have the two ends, uh, the two uh, the ends uh, called, see, there you are, at the ends. I remember them. Uh, they're open, of course, to let the smoke out. They have two beams crossing with horses' heads on them, and uh, they let the smoke out. That's the thing you have to have. And through a, a, a sparrow flew through one of those and was panicked in the light and flew around uh, for a moment in panic and then flew out the other one. King Oswald noticed that. He said, look at that sparrow. He comes in out of the dark, unknown. He sees a brilliant flash of light for a minute. All he is is confused. Then he's gone, and that's it. She said, that's our life. And that converted him to Christianity, which he thought might teach him something of what went before and what behind. But by that time, Christianity was not teaching anything of the sort either way. They didn't believe we saw in a physical resurrection. Could read a paper on the subject, but I won't. And the physical resurrection, and, and they had absolutely thrown out the pre-existence, which is absolutely basic in early Judaism and Christianity. Well, uh, that... Uh, this going of time, I was looking at that. There are a couple of quotations I'm going to read to you now, and then we'll resume with the Book of Mormon. Uh, Hawking says, Maybe what we call imaginary time, imaginary time, is really more basic. And what we recall real is just an idea we invent to help us describe what we think the universe is like. That's what we're talking about. We're stuck with this time business. A scientific theory is just a mathematical model we make to describe our observations. And Warren Wheeler, at Texas, a great... Uh, Nuclear science says, science can only describe, it never explains. It will never tell you why. All it can do is describe phenomena. But to resume Hawking's quotation, he says, it exists only in our minds, that is the model we make of the universe. So it is meaningless to ask which is real, or which is real or imaginary time, it's like Shakespeare. It is simply a matter of which is the more useful description. And Zuk, our friend Zukov says, now we'll see that physics may require a more complete alteration of our thought process than we ever conceived possible. 
in fact, or that we ever could conceive. That, we don't just change a few ideas and say, well, this is in, in abstract, in theory, this is very interesting. No, sir, he says. This requires a more complete op uh, alteration of our thought process than we ever conceive, or in fact could conceive, the same as saying of Niels Bohr on that subject. And Bell's theorem, the one thing that's really new in physics today, I'm quoting it, Bell's theorem tells us that there is no such thing as separate parts. All parts of the universe are connected in immediate, intimate, immediate way, previously claimed only by mystics and other scientific people. Bell's theorem shows that common sense ideas are inadequate even to describe macroscopic events, events of the everyday world. And then Henry Stapp says, our ordinary ideas about the world are somehow profoundly deficient, even on the macroscopic level. There's the things you see around you. Events in the world at large, the world of freeway sport cars, behave in ways which are utterly different from our common sense view of them. It should be obvious now that we do not see reality, if only because we see so little. Uh, we have tunnel vision, you see. If the gospel, we have to work with knowledge we have. Uh, and, but when more knowledge is offered, we reject it as rule. Well, don't do that. That's a silly thing to do. Remember, as he says, we, we only see 1%. The star, we can see lots of stars and so forth, and we can see out... 15, maybe 20 billion light years with new telescopes, all marvelous things. But they say we see less than 100%, less than 1%, excuse me, of what's really there. I mean, it's nearly all dark matter as far as we're concerned. So we don't know what's going on anywhere, he says. So we have only our memories to show for our existence, and they are a quickly fading vapor trail, as, as Shakespeare puts it so neatly. So we come to this ninth chapter, and it introduces us. I say it, it lowers the shield and shows us that there is something behind it. <coughs> and this follows then. The tenth chapter, you see, then another world really breaks through. And it's interesting, the Christian theolo theologians today have suddenly become enamored of that expression, a breakthrough. Christianity was a breakthrough, a breakthrough in the ordinary lives of men. It was something different. Well, of course it was a breakthrough. How much are you willing to, to recognize that? A breakthrough, a recognition, intellectual breakthrough. The So this shows that another world breaks through the tenth one. These are the... The survivors here. We're talking about the people at the temple, see. And the Lord speaks, notice he speaks here, and he laments. The whole world has gone wrong. Notice the tenth one. The, this is the way we should have been. See, this is, this is the big breakthrough. Was silence for many hours. They ceased lamenting. Then they heard the voice. And what a calling down it gave. I wanted to do everything for you. I gave you a standing offer, and you would not accept it. I couldn't force you to. I wouldn't twist your arm. Your place will be le shall become desolate. It means that quite literally. If you won't be gathered, your place will become desolate. And when they heard that, they began to realize what fools they had been. And they began to weep and howl for loss of their kindred and for three the three days of darkness and then the morning and so forth. And the more righteous part of the people naturally had gone to the temple. So you had a sort of selective survival here. The destruction hadn't been so great then. And then it lists the parts that were not sunk and buried. Notice from 13 on, it takes, tells us the places that were destroyed, but there were a lot of places that weren't destroyed. In other words, it wasn't complete destruction. It was just a major earthquake. I, probably 8.1 on the Richter scale or something like that. But, uh, and notice, keep saying, not sunk or buried, not burned, not crushed, not carried away, not overpowered. This tells us that a lot of them were, you see. Uh, uh, striking, what they're doing is like a play. You see, they're striking the old set. In the last day of the play, you know, you have a lot of kids, I have a lot of kids that were in drama this way or that. And the last day of the play, the whole cast has to stake and, and strike the set. They not only strike the set, but meantime, the set for tomorrow's play is already set up and ready to go. And that's what we're doing now. They're striking the set all around us, but are we building up Zion? Are we building the new set that should be there when this comes down in a cloud of dust, you see? We become awfully good at demolitions today. You notice how they can demolish those buildings? Bingo, in a couple of seconds. One thing we're good at is garbage and demolition. <laughs> what a civilization. Well, here it was, you see. Uh, he, uh, in this 10th chapter, this tells us something has survived. It gets them ready now. What's going to happen? It says, notice, the people of Nephi were spared. It ends by saying the people of Nephi were spared, and they've been showed great blessings and great favors insomuch that after the ascension of Christ into heaven, he manifests himself. So the story is not over. There's going to be another episode. Well, there's some encouragement for us. We can feel good about that for a change. But now we come to the 11th chapter. This is perhaps the most powerful statement in the Book of Mormon. I, I never can read it because I'll, I'll choke up every time I try to do it. And it's so very simple. That's the idea, see. I say the stranger, he's one of their own. 
you do not dispute. You repent and, and get your act together, he says. I am uh, pulling the family together, he says. I want to bring you back to the Father again. He appears entirely to individuals. He always appears to individuals. That's what an atonement is. He, he greets them one by one. He gives them the signs of tokens one by one. He converses with them one by one. He blesses the children one by one. He gives each person to understand. There's some, uh, if we look, for example, it, that comes th through here in uh, the 15th chapter, the 35th verse, where we're told, uh, oh, come on. Uh, 1535? Oh, no, 1115. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Yes. Many fi I have testified. Always getting wrong. Well, here's the one by one. They, the, the, that's the one by one. And then there's another pad. Then it's the 35th verse that I uh, says another industry. He says, This is my doctrine. The doctrine of the Father, and whoso believeth in me, in the Father also, unto him. Notice it's in the singular. Whoever believes in me, I will come to him, and the Father will be right there. Notice, here, here is the cast of characters, and it's not the multitude or the mob or the chorus. It's the Father, it's the Son, and it's the individual. And the Father also will come unto him, and the Father will be a record of me, singular, the Father singular, for he will visit him. Singular, see, with fire and with the Holy Ghost. That's an individual. He's not going to visit the church in the abstract or something like that. He comes to, to every individual there. And then in the, the, the 21st chapter, uh, verse of the 14th chapter, where he says, for your... Always mix them up. What is this? Is this? No, 21st verse of the 17th chapter. Jump around. They're good ones, though. Yes, here we are, 21st verse, 17th chapter. And when he had said these words, he wept, and the multitude bare record of it. And he took their little children one by one and blessed them, gave each one a blessing. That's something to receive a blessing from the Lord. It's your own. And blessed them and prayed unto the Father for them. And when he had done this, he wept again. Well, why the weeping, you see? This enormous contrast. It goes with joy also. We come to that. And then the, uh, there's this one to consider, the 20, 21st. 21, the 25th verse, here again. And the multitude did see, ah, now we have the multitude. Did they, <laughs> there is a, a well-known uh, grammatical expression in Greek. The whole multitude rose as a single man and waved his hat. Of course, it was a single man, he waved his hat as a single man. But listen, no, but listen. The whole multitude did hear and bear record, and they know that their record is true, for all of them did see every man for himself, you see. He didn't say, well, did you see, and you were impressed because everybody else was yelling, so they must be seeing something. No, every man saw for himself, even though it was the multitude we're talking about. They heard it in their bear record. There were 2,500 of them, men, women, and children. Every man saw. So this is this individual appearance. This is so very important to us here. And then we have a new beginning. This emphasis on children, you see, that we get in the 11th chapter here, is this new beginning. <laughs> Only the children uncontaminated. The <coughs> angels come down and teach them. They don't wither in the presence of, of angels. Now the 12th chapter. <laughs> this is very important. And this is where we have, well, here are the Beatitudes. And... That's, that's the Sermon on the Mount. It comes here, and notice what a summary. This chapter, in these 48 verses, summarizes the moral teachings of the Lord here. But what emphasizes here, notice, there's no rank. The, thir the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is, is given here, and it's given in the New Testament. I was looking at, at it this morning, just now. It is given to the disciples in answer to the question, who are qualified to be taken into the church? They're not general statements. That they apply at all times. But remember what he says. Uh, uh, the, he says the disciples came to him. Sabbath alone. He just gave it to the disciples in the New Testament. But here, he's not talking to the disciples in an unbelieving world. Here, he's talking to all the believers. They're all his disciples here. He all talks to them. And it applies here. But still, the same thing applies. What are the qualities of a member of the church? What do they have to have? They should have various qualities. But... Uh, Blessed are they, more blessed... Well, he goes here, who believe in your... Which he also said to the Jews. And then, yes, he begins with the third verse. Blessed are the poor, 
in spirit, who come unto me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and so on. Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are they who weep. Now, he's talking to the multitude who have come to him. This is very, this is very appropriate, and it and applies all the way through here, doesn't it? The children. He tells us in verses 40 to 41 at the end here, there is no other plan, no other arrangement will do. This is universal. It's the plan throughout all the other worlds and so forth. Again, you say, well, isn't that going to be rather monotonous? Is, is it as simple as all that to go on for eternity after eternity? Well, we see the, the problems of multiplicity here, how you can multiply things and worlds and things like that. <laughs> the, the, the example that, uh, that well, you can, you can do it with a 16 notes of a scale, but the example that uh, Arthur Clarke gives is the, is the uh, checker game you play. How many moves can you make in a game of checkers? Well, if you had a million computers and each computer made a million moves a second. How long would it take to play all possible games of chess? It would take 30 billion billion years. That's quite a while, isn't it? To play each of a million machines making a million moves a second, you see. Uh, is it 300 million or 30 billion? It doesn't make any difference as far as that goes. I say it's a very simple factorial, just figure it out. But uh, that's how complex things are, you see. All these combinations, things are with only eight with only eight notes to work with, how will you ever invent a new melody? Ah, this is up to you. This is where you come in. That's your anthropism all the way, you see. Nature isn't going to invent something that's beautiful and pleasing. Well, it does. It does it all the time. But you have to be there to react to it, or it's not going to be there. Well, anyway, as we go through these chapters here. Now, we're rushing through. We've read them already. And so I, we want to get on to, well, maybe the, uh, uh, maybe the Jaredites, their favorite. But we don't get to them yet. We get third Nephi, and then yeah, we get to, to Mormon, don't we? Yeah. Then we get oh well, fourth Nephi, and existence Alawato. That's nice. We have to have that. But that's a short one, as as uh, Voltaire says. Happy the people whose annals are a blank. If there's no history, it means you're having a happy time. Our history consists only in trouble and crimes. I mean, you turn on the TV, you're not going to be interested unless somebody's pointing a gun at somebody. Or, yeah, that, that's all you'll find today. There's got to be trouble, and big trouble, and lots of violence. That taste, that incurable taste for violence that we're having now is, bids very ill in terms of Book of Mormon. Well, the 12th chapter tells us that there is to be no rank. It's Sermon on the Mount, on the qualifications of membership. Who shall be admitted to the kingdom? From 21st, verse 21st on, we're told that the old law is still in effect. The old law was well nigh perfect in its way. It's far more humane, covers more grounds than our laws today. We talk about the fierce, savage, old tribal, vengeful God of the Old Testament. Don't fool yourself. Read the laws he gave them. Our laws aren't half, half so kind, half so just, half so considerate of the, of the uh, oppressed. And uh, so it's still in full effect and to be taken more seriously than ever before by the individual. And notice he's, he tells us here that conscience displaces uh, police orders. You, you have to have your conscience there, the, the golden rule. Uh, the second, the first and second commandment he talks about. Well, the twelfth chapter. Now, I'm sure you have all read this, but notice this he takes in the Old Te New Testament too. He says, I have not come to do away with the law, but fulfill the law. You do this all up to now. It's as if you were to come the savage old primitive law of the word of wisdom. When people used to get hopelessly drunk and they'd chew tobacco and uh, they'd take all sorts of things that were bad for them and they'd misbehave, they'd, uh, they'd pass out every night from uh, two quarts of cognac or something like that. And this was the way they do. Now, we're going to do away with that law. Does that mean, well, thank heaven, we can now break the word of wisdom? <laughs> of course not. It means we don't even think of it anymore. That's contained in all the other laws. See, that's why the Lord says to the apostles, two commandments take care of everything. In these two commandments, on these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, etc., and thou thy neighbor as thyself. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, you won't have to be told to, not to go out and kill people, and not to go out and lie, and not to go out and, and steal. And uh, even from your enemies, you're not supposed to do that, though with us it's a virtue. And uh, as Antigone said, and uh, the same way, if we, uh, we wouldn't have to be told to do these terrible things if they become just part of our life. We don't have to even think of it. Do you have to rehearse? You say, no, I have to remember first thing before I go out this morning. I mustn't shoot anybody. I shoot anybody. And uh, 
Unfortunately, I don't have a gun today. But, but uh, no, that's no joke. There have been civilizations that have sunk so low. That I'm going to do, that's going to be part of the course. I have some wonderful stuff in the ancient world to show you what people really go for and be so much like ours. It's just embarrassing. Well, anyway, here he goes, notice. Blessed are they... Well, you, we know the Beatitudes here. We don't go through them. But I'm talking about the, the 12th chapter from the third verses on, who shall obtain mercy. The pure, for they shall see God. See, no impure thing can stand in the presence of God. If you were impure and had to stand in the presence of God, that would be worse than any hell you could possibly suffer. Anything you could possibly imagine, have that guilt with you. For they shall see God. They can do it without being withered. Blessed are all the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God and those who are per persecuted for the kingdom of heaven's sake. So we go here. Then, here are the Ten Commandments. You notice here that the same old Ten Commandments, but he brings them up and makes them, as he says, matters of conscience. He says, thou shalt not kill. But if you're even angry, you see, fulfilling the law is farther here. If you have the urge to kill, the impulse to kill, that is where the danger is, you see. As they say, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Well, this is the people kill people part of it, you see. Well, guns are a great help, you understand. They simplify matters vastly. Over 30,000 murders a year with guns in this country alone. That breaks an all-time record. Uh, but you d don't get angry, because when you get angry, you notice you shift gears into a totally different mood. You're devilish, you're fiendish, there's things you might want to do. For a moment, you have the impulse to kill. If you had the ability, you'd do it, and so that's terrible. You watch the anger, you see. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, is worse than uh, he shall, well, he says, who says Raka, shall be in danger of the council, Racha is what it is, and whoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. That's the worst. Well, as a Raka is cursed you, may you die. Raka is cursing. But the worst than that is to call him a fool. Despise, to despise a person is worse than to hate him, you see. To be despised is worse than anger. The worst thing you can do is to hold a person in utter contempt, and that's when you say he's a fool. Don't despise anybody, you see. God despises him. You don't despise anyone. Therefore, Notice, she should come to me, remember, if thy brother has thought against him, clear it up. Because don't, uh, the uh, Talmud puts it very nicely here, the Jews put it nicely as far as this goes. When, when you think of that way of, uh, against your brother, no matter who it is, remember, I am insulting the image of God, he says. If that's the image of God, it should always be treated with respect. And you can't despise what you don't know or you don't understand. So to say thou fool is actually worse, is deserving of hell fire. Uh, whereas if you have, uh, well, like killing your enemy or something like that, if you have that strong impulse uh, to, to hit somebody, that's not as bad, actually, as to despise you. And that's, uh, that's the best kind of punishment. You know how that is, to hold in complete contempt. Be reconciled to thy brother. No matter what, be reconciled to him and agree with your adversary. Never burn your bridges behind you, because you're, we're governed by impulse, you see, and we'll do foolish things, and the other person, he may repent and we may repent. And many stories, you see, about the angels pleading to God to go down and destroy the word, world in the time of Noah and so forth, and they were so wicked, and God says, no, give them more time, give them more time. He is long-suffering, as the uh, Rahman Rahim, as the, as the Quran says. He is Rahman, he is gentle. Well, la hawla wa ta'ala billahi Rahman Rahim. There is no power and there is no might except to God, and he never uses it. He is gentle, he is forbearing, he gives men as long as they want, and then they destroy themselves. That's very near the truth, too. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on here, therefore agree with your adversary. Don't get into trouble or you'll get cast into prison and so forth. And uh, Brother uh, Jack Welch will tell you about this verse. He's a lawyer and has studied it. It has to do with the rules of the ancient law. And again, it's not, not committing adultery. And what's the 28th verse? Pornography. They don't use the word pornography, a new word, but the same thing. Pornography is the same sort of thing, isn't it? Lusting in your mind and the like. It was said of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, who has ever looketh upon a woman to lust, to look with lust, well, there's pornography, the same thing. You see. It's, these things are all bad. The, the law is going farther than the old Jewish law. The, uh, and you suffer these things to enter into your heart. To refrain from doing a thing, you must refrain from thinking of it then you don't have to refer to the law books, you see. You don't have to read the fine print and so forth that the lawyers dig up. Uh, then, uh, to refrain from popular vices, it tells us here, uh, takes real restraint. Notice the 30th verse here, we're on the 
the 12th chapter. It's better that you deny yourselves these things. See, this Book of Mormon has these things. Deny yourselves these things wherein you take up your cross that you should, then you should be cast into hell. This admits, you see, that these temptations are strong. That's what you're here for, to put up against them, you see. And to resist them requires great will and strength, yeah? What does it mean to be take up your cross? Take up your cross, that, the, uh, that you should take up, that you will take up your cross, then you should be cast into hell. Cross and the crucifixion did not begin with the Romans. The Celeb, the oldest sect we have in the Middle East, the Celeb, the, the Christians, the cross. Well, the, the carrying of your cross and uh, the bearing of a cross is a very ancient punishment. The Assyrians loved it. They loved crucifixion. And you carry your cross. No, this is, a, this is a term with which these people would be familiar, I'm quite sure. And also you notice there's a great deal of crucifixion. Well, I don't know a great deal, but in percentage. If you look in the Aztec and Mayan art, especially the Aztec, crucifixion uh, and uh, posting people up on, on crosses and nailing them up, cruel punishments for, to be flayed alive, to be eaten by birds and so forth. They're quite common in the art. The cross is, a, is very common. These, uh, there's some interesting humorous, uh, uh, humorous, very humorous subject, you know. Uh, it's your tall leg. You see the tall leg raised upon the cross. No, it's a very old thing. Uh, on the other hand, but when he says cross yourself, well, that's another time. That means check yourself, of course. Yes, that you should take up your cross, uh, deny yourself. You should take up your cross, and you should be cast into hell. There's an interesting thing that's never been been solved. In the uh, I had two years of Latin epigraphy with H.R.W. Smith years ago. He was the foremost Latin epigrapher in the world. He was Oxford, and he edited the great Corpus Fasorum with all these pictures uh, with the Latin graffiti and the Latin pictures and so forth. And always on the schoolroom pictures, and this is in Rome, pre-Christian. This is way back in Republican time and so forth. You always had these crosses, and they never could understand. And there's a school song that says the, the school term is to begin again, take up your cross and get back to work. So it's a term with which the ancient world was familiar. Uh, it's not just Christian, not by any means. And of course, we always talk about uh, the great cross at, uh, at uh, what's we call them, at tourists go out. And uh, of, uh, not in the hymn, Papy, they're like that. Well, we continue here, see, and then he talks again. And no, no divorce. It's very easy in, in Semitic cult, cultures to divorce a person. All you have to do in Islam is to say to a, uh, a woman three times, et lakaki, et lakaki, I release you, I release you, I release you, and she's no longer married to you. It's as easy as that. And it was easy with the Jews too, but, but you can't do that anymore, the Lord says. We can't do that in the 31st, except for the cause of fornication, causing her to commit adultery, that's all. And again, you shall not forswear yourself, but don't swear at all. Forswearing is perjury. But don't make any oaths, because when you make an oath, you promise that you will do something or else do something else. You have no com command of that, or else, or else you will pay a certain penalty or fee, but you're not able to determine that fee. For example, it was often People, people often swore that they would never uh, shave again until they murdered the prophet Joseph Smith. Well, they, they didn't keep their oaths and so on. But when it's uh, something the Lord says, you can't change a single hair of your head, white or black, you can't add a cubit to your stature, you can't make any changes, how can, you, how can you make any swear when you don't know? See, I swear to do something by such and such a date, or else I, I will do so and so. You don't know whether you'll be in a condition to do that or not. He says, swear not at all, for the heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. You can't swear by heaven, it's not yours. It's the throne of God and you can't control the earth. And as far as swearing by yourself, your head or anything is concerned, you don't know what the situation will be. So you're, you're committing a very grave offense when you, when you commit yourself to a future you know nothing about. He says, to, to sw forswear yourself, the 35th verse, is perjury, but this is to make an engagement you can't, uh, can't possibly keep. You very possibly won't keep. Notice, swear not at all by heaven, for it is God's throne, by the earth, for it is God's footstool, neither by thy head. Thou canst not make one hair black or white. But what, what do you do in a case like that? You don't prove things this way or that way. See, a person swears in court that a thing is so, well, how do you know it? he isn't lying and so forth? You can forswear. Don't swear at all. You say, yea, yea, and nay, nay. That's all you can do, you see. You bear your testimony. Uh, there's no contention. The uh, testimony alone remains. There's no disputation. There's no point to it. When you teach, you point. See, teach means the word teach, touch, dactyl, same word as Greek dactyl. 
uh, like didactic, things like that, deco to show. It means to point to a thing. When you teach, all you can do is point to a thing. You can't teach a person, you can't put it inside the person, anything like that. All you can do is point to it and let, let him react, you see. And it's the same way here. The, uh, when you say a thing, is so yeah, yeah, nay, nay. Let him disprove it if he wants to, and you prove it if you want. But you bear your testimony, and that's all you can do about it. Uh, a few years ago, a convention of Scottish ministers wrote to President McKay from Scotland, defying him to make them believe the Book of Mormon, to prove that he, he could prove the Book of Mormon, of all things, you see. They will twist your arm. You can't prove it. Make a person believe in God. You can't make a person believe in anything. All you can do is say, yay, yay, and that's it. Bear your testimony and let them see for yourself. The Spirit's the one that will bear testimony as far as you're concerned, but you can't. You can't have a testimony for somebody else. For everything. So he says, don't do that. Uh, because whatsoever is more than this comes of the devil. See, that, that's a disputation. Once you start, you say it's so, you say it's black, I say it's white, and so forth, and we can go arguing forever because you're convinced and I'm convinced. There can be bad blood between us and so forth. But I can say what I think it is and let you think over it and think about it. And you can say why you think it's so and let me think about it. That's as far as we can go. Any more than that is devilish and make trouble. And then the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, you see. Yeah. I wish the Jews would at least observe that today in Shamir, but observe that in Palestine. You know, there was a, a, uh, a correspondent from the New York Times who was Jewish, and he's now a citizen of Israel, who coined the phrase, you put one of ours in the hospital, we'll put 200 of yours in the morgue. Well, now, we used to think the eye for an eye was a rather savage rule, didn't we? But when you say, you wound one of ours and we'll kill 200 of yours, that is not an eye for an eye. <laughs> it goes far beyond the wildest savagery. But I know some of them that are acting on that principle. I've known some of those people well when I was at Ritchie. Uh, that was just a long way back. Well, what our entire obsession, this is our entire obsession, an eye for an eye. The opposite is you shall not resist evil. You can't eliminate it. What do you do? How do you eliminate it? How do you resist it? By doing good. Do good. That's, that will heap coals on the head of your enemy and nothing else will do it. But you cannot, by resisting directly, do evil. Uh, and that alone can defuse it, as far as that goes. The classic example, Book of Mormon again, people of Ammon. They decided the only way they could resist evil was to do good. They had more effect than all the other armies and everything else. And, remember when they refused to fight and so forth? And if a person wants to sue you and take away your coat, let him have your coat also. Well, that is, uh, President Oaks was in my ward. He was in, in my priesthood quorum. And, uh, he used to teach us a uh, high priest school. When he, was, he was a lawyer, as you know. One lesson he used always to drive home. He says, any settlement out of court, no matter how bad, is better than any settlement in court, no matter how good. Whatever you do, never go to court. This is from a lawyer, see, a judge. <laughs> Became a Supreme Court judge. And he still believes that, that any settlement out of court is better than any settlement in court. And so it says if he wants to take your coat, he wants to sue you, let him have your coat. Let him have everything, but don't go to court, court about it. Uh, go with him twain. And if he asks uh, if uh, ask thee, uh, and to him that asketh from thee, he wants to borrow something, uh, don't turn him away. Uh, the old arguments are no longer valid, you see. Here's Antigone, that you should love your enemies, uh, love your friends and hate your enemies. That's the law of the ancient city-state and so forth. It's just the opposite now. Pray for them to despitefully use it. Uh, there's no way of making them, stopping them from being your enemies except that. If you don't accept them as your enemies, well, then you don't have enemies then. They may be plotting against you, but they'll have to have some pretty good grounds for action and so forth. That ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. No child of God will, ha will hate the image of God, as the Jews say. No child of God is going to hate the image of God, no matter who it is. You have to, you have to concede that. And it's so funny, you see, to see. Here we were, we had these, we talked about the uh, Germans just as we were talking about the Russians. And suddenly one day on the 7th of May in 1945, we signed a piece of paper, and all the Germans around me, German prisoners, my best friends. We got a lot more. There's no, no wrong at all. No bad feelings or anything like that. It's really ridiculous, isn't it? Why we have to have this enmity. And so the old law, the law and in me are all fulfilled. Old things are done away with. All things have become new. So that's the cycle of life, you see. That's it. We're not going to be stuck forever in this road. We don't have to stay the way we're living. Uh, remember that, you see. You say, this too shall have an end. That's true. But better than that, there'll be something better after it. All things shall become new. Therefore, I say that you should be perfect. Well, here's this we like to quote, be perfect. 
All right, there's a simple rule. Any questions, just be perfect and all your questions are answered. If I have a question in math, I'll have to say, well, what would Einstein do? Oh, boy, I've got a solution now, that's it. It, it isn't that easy, but as I was explaining the last time, what you mean by perfect is tamim. It, it used that for the perfect circle. And tamim is a per doesn't have to be big or small to be a circle, but it has to be a circle. It has to be fulfilled within its particular department and its calling. You can be perfect uh, in certain things, but that means perpetual repentance. Notice, this is an ongoing process, be perfect. He doesn't expect you to achieve that all the way. <laughs> It's uh, like a telling a person, as Brigham Young used to tell the saints, learn everything. Okay, I'll go home and learn everything. No, you won't. You knew you wouldn't. But if that wasn't the goal, you wouldn't learn very much. You see, that's the point. And if you're not striving to be perfect, you won't repent. It's like this line of, uh, what's his name? Uh, see the picture here? He has some pictures of it. He draws a line of dots like this, and he says, Here's a second, you see the flash, you move up here and you see the flash. Does it keep flashing? No, it only flashed once, he says. But how can it just keep flashing like this all the time? You can see it a thousand times. And uh, a million years later, it's still going on. And if you get the dots close enough together, it just would be one continuous flash, like a movie and so forth. But that's absurd. Is it the real event? How can you get that much? Pascal expresses it beautifully, that the spirit uh, the immensity of the spirit that is dependent on the physical body the same way. He says you have to eat bread to survive. You have to chew something. You have to swallow food. Mais que de penser pour une morceau de pain. But how many thoughts can you get out of one piece of bread? You, see? you have to have the bread, but how many thoughts can you get out of one piece of bread? There's no proportion at all between them. You see, we're dealing, we're bringing the infinite and the finite together here, and they do unite in us here. They do have an eternal spirit. We'll feel it is absent. So, we better rush on to the 13th chapter here. Anything else here? Well, well. now here's another theme. The theme here, uh, the, this 12th chapter, yes, is there's no need for putting on a show or hypocrisy uh, and display or anything like that. This is where he's talking about that. This is your social behavior, see, for the world in general here. And it includes the Lord Prayer, uh, the, well, from the seventh verse it goes on. And now this is the short Lord's Prayer, but it has the old ending, the old archaic ending, see. The, and they tell you the Book of Mormon's a fake because it puts this ending in the prayer. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. I think it's done, yes. <coughs> Notice it's short here. Uh, and, uh, but as uh, Joachim Jeremiah has shown, that is part of the old original Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and it's so short here. Our Father who is in heaven, notice it's Zion on earth, it's heaven on earth. Where his will is done, that is Zion, that is his kingdom. You see, the kingdom is where, where his Lord, so thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then it was thy kingdom. See, thy kingdom come, if it comes, that's where your will is done. Of course, where the king's will is done, that's his kingdom. Where it's not done, that's something else. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he uses the word debts. You notice they, they like to slide over that in the King James and say, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against. But the word actually is the business, commercial word used is, is debts. Uh, because the one thing that keeps us from being united and that keeps the kingdom of God from being here is that men are subject to each other. They're in debt to each other. It's debt that enslaves us and holds us down. We can't be free and equal in the kingdom of God in Zion. Remember, they had all good things where he says, the Lord called his people Zion, for they had, uh, and there were no, for they had all, what is it? Uh, for they had all things in common. I thought it was later. For they had all things in common. There were no poor among them. And uh, that's necessary here. <coughs> and so, He's, he's talking about debts, and we use it. You see what the great obstacle is to everything now. I, I mean, you mentioned drugs, you mentioned war, you mentioned everything else. What's the big problem in Russia? I mean, economy everywhere you go, you're saying you're not going to straighten it out uh, by appealing to uh, the Dow Jones. And this, don't lead us into temptation. Uh, oh, for we our debts as we for we our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Uh, you know, this is the, the 13th chapter, isn't it? To lead into temptation. What is the great temptation? In the Book of Mormon, we're told the four things with which Satan tempts man. Remember, to try man and tempt man. And they are power, gain, popularity, or authority, and the pleasures of the flesh, the vain things of the world. 
those are the things that we're tempted. And don't lead us into that in our church. Actually, we have been permitted. We've been taken up right up to the border, like the hero in the pearl, that ancient Christian. Pearl. We're on the border. Well, we can step, you can get into it if you want, or you can take as much of it as you want. It's not entirely up to you, but don't lead us into temptation. And don't let us go too far here. Temptation we must have, but let's be careful about that. But, but deliver us from evil. He says that, yes. The, uh, well, time's up. I was going to go through this faster. But uh, now, this is a long book. Remember, we have this long, this is just a, it's not an epitome. It's got as much teaching of the prophet. See, you can read all the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament in half an hour. That's exactly what it takes to read these two. We've got it all here, but it's different. You'll notice that. It's not radically different by any means. But see what it means here in this, in this other setting. Let's see here.